Welcome everybody to our next episode of Global Sport Matters Live, where we bring together experts from all different areas of the world to talk about issues that are impacting sport. Uh, today's conversation will be led by Dr. Scott Brooks from our team. So um, one of the things that we like to do at the very top of the show is recognize the lands uh, where this conversation, where Arizona State University is, where Global Sport Institute is held. We recognize that these lands belong to the Maricopa and Pima peoples. And we, uh, again, uh, are thrilled that we can uh, welcome you all today um, to have this conversation. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our host for the day, Dr. Scott Brooks. Good day. Thanks, Kendall. We've got a very exciting day planned for all of you. We thank you for coming and spending a little over an hour or so, an hour with us. Just to give you a, a little bit about what's going to happen next week. So I want to, we're going to talk about what we're going to talk about today, but I want to give you a little heads up on next week. Next week, we're going to have a panel again right here, Global Sport Matters Live, June 12th. We're going to be talking about the future of youth sport. And in that, we'll cover the reset as we've been doing here at the Global Sport Matters Live. I want to encourage you to share questions, to make sure you fill in that the chat box, make sure that you're using our hashtags, hashtag Global Sport Matters. Follow us on Global Sport Matters on Twitter and on Instagram and do the same thing for our wonderful panelists. So just an intro to the topic, right? In February, parts of the world grounded to a halt. We all know this, we've all been a part of this. You know, it happened in China, it happened in Italy, all around the world, and then it came to us here in the US. We still don't know if we've seen the worst of this COVID-19. We don't know how it's gonna impact us in the fall, but there are some things that have happened, right? People have, have taken this opportunity to do some things, to become better. And so I'm gonna introduce you to some of our panelists and let you hear a little bit about what's been done. Uh, we are the first group of panelists are a part of a, a group, a Zoom call, 12 inches over. It is really about professional development and learning what it takes to succeed at the head coaching uh, job at that role. This started with Jeff Arnold, who is an assistant coach at Ryder University. And we also have uh, other 12 inches over uh, part members, Lou Ritchie, who is a high school coach out of Oakland, California at Bishop O'Dowd, my alma mater, and it's a great basketball place, a great place for students. And we have the legendary, the coach Don Staley, the head coach at South Carolina. So we've got a really exciting panel for you. We're gonna cover not only what has been going on in COVID-19 and what they've been doing, but we're also gonna talk about this ever-growing list of black people killed by the police, KBP, right? And how this has sparked a national crisis. We wanna be able to, to talk about what's going on, to say the names, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, Deion Johnson, Tony McDay, right? The list goes on and on. And our coaches have had to talk to their student athletes about this in this difficult time. So we're gonna start there. I wanna start off by asking Coach, uh, Coach Jeff, tell us a little bit about what is 12 inches over. Well, 12 inches over is really a, I would say, a, a discussion with friends. That's how it started. Um, wanted to get all of my basketball friends together to talk about basketball ideas and issues. And it's primarily just very good friends of mine that I sent out a text message to, would you be interested in doing this? And I got the idea from doing your Zoom call, Scott, when you talked about this time and what was happening. And then, um, so I, I reached out and everybody said, hey, they were interested. And 20 guys turned into 70 plus each session and we go twice a week. Just discussing issues and topics that are affecting the game of basketball and how we can promote uh, our game, how we can get better at our game from the high school level to we have pro coaches on, on our, our Zoom. So it's, it's been really good. Fantastic. Coach Don, so how did you learn about 12 inches on, over? 
Um, I, I learned about it from um, um, not not Jeff, probably not not any of the Philly guys. Um, um, someone, I think he's an AD. He's an AD at a at a high school, and um, he told me just to come on and you know. First, I was like, oh, no, I'm not. I, I'm I don't, I don't want to do that. And then when I finally got on and I and I was listening to what was happening, I, I thought this was, you know, a beautiful thing just to have all these coaches, you know, have guests, hear about hear about the history of Philadelphia um, from their perspective because they were they Jeff and them were in it. They got history in Philly. And a lot of times, um, I, I was playing and I was just kind of a, that little girl just running around just trying to find the next game and I wasn't really paying attention to what's happening and who really paved the way um for not only myself as a just and I don't even say a female hooper it was just Philadelphia hoopers and, and giving them a, an opportunity to play and now they're giving me an opportunity to learn and grow there's so much growth occurring so much development occurring on those on those calls I mean, I'm not on all of them, um, but for the ones that I've been a part of, I've learned. I, I take notes. Um, I, I actually print off the notes uh, once you all send them to us because I, I they're keepers. I, and I, I'm old school, so you know I, I like I like I like to feel it. I know I can read it on my phone and my iPad and all that, but I like to feel it. I like to have it. I like to share it um, because it's great during this time. We're not we're winning this weight. We're winning the weight by doing these type of things. Scott, before you, go, before you go to Lou, Dawn, he is a Philly guy. He just happens to be an AD in Cincinnati now. But he's a Philly guy. That's that's Greg, he called Greg, me into, Greg yeah, Greg, Greg is a Philly guy. So he he called me and said, Look at your phone. Dawn had texted me. Oh, I don't get an invite. <laughs> Yeah, it is, it's a pleasure to have her on that call. It's definitely a pleasure. Lou, why don't you tell us, you know, how did you come involved in, and how does this relate to a high school coach? Some people, you know, the call is overwhelmingly college with some pros. How does this relate to you? Well, you know, I found out about it uh, because of you and Jason Powell, two high school teammates. <clears throat> and, um, you know, as a, as a high school coach, you deal with the same things as you do on the college and pro level, just probably on a smaller perspective. But, you know, 12 Inches Over deals with the intersection of race and sport in this pre-current and post-COVID era. So, you know, it being organic, diverse, real honest, you know, emotional, passionate. And those are all things that we are at the high school level. Um, so for me, I get a chance to hear solutions to my questions that I might not be able to pose. I also get a chance to hear solutions to maybe something that Don comes up with. Um, and it keeps me thinking into the future, which I think is the most important thing to be a critical thinker and to be a teacher is you want to keep teaching our kids to be forward thinking. Yeah, you know, Coach Don, one of the things that we felt when we were on that call was how powerful your voice was, that you were the leading black voice in coaching, that that was hands down. That was an obvious statement for us. And I, I wanted you to talk a little bit about the importance for black coaches getting together because. We have our call, but there are other ways in which you've been involved with making sure that black coaches are having a voice. Um, super important. And I, I, I really don't know the power of my voice. And it was great to hear you all say that because, you know, you don't know. You know, I, I, I do try to stay in my lane. I, I, I absolutely do. And that's my comfort zone. But I, but I find that um, in that comfort zone, you know, a lot of times people aren't going to come in there. You you got you got to rear out, and you you gotta you gotta make your. And, and for me, I have to convey what's in my heart, and I usually lead with that. And um, from that, we we do actually have a, um, we call it the WOC, um, the Women of Color. There's a there's a lot of coaches that uh, we we've been doing this for years. This this same type of thing. Um, but it gets enhanced now because we're able to meet a lot more through Zoom. We're able to talk a lot more. We, we have our, our outreaches a lot further out because of um, everybody is so um, 
closed off in their homes because of COVID-19. Um, I, I, just, I just feel like it's, it's, it's something that I have to do. I, I spoke on, I spoke out in the Players' Tribune um, because that was in my, on my heart. And I know we're, we're probably going to discuss it, you know, but to see a, a young man take his last breath, um, to see a young man um, call out for his mom, to, to hear him plead for his last breath was eye-opening because some of the other uh, uh, murders from police brutality, it, it was either um, at the station or they got rushed to the hospital and then they died in those places. And it, your imagination goes to, oh, well, maybe, maybe it happened this way or maybe it happened that way. And you can kind of spin it a little bit in your mind just so because you don't want to believe that that really took place. But there's no mistaking how uh, George Floyd lost his life. And it, it hit me hard because, not because I think it could be me or my brother or my sister, because I've never seen it before. It was a first time experience of, of seeing it. And then as I'm looking on social media, I just saw a video this morning of someone that, that was there the entire time asking the police officer, to please, the man can't breathe. The man is not moving. The man is, you know, and they like, you You killed him. And, you know, it just brings it back up again. So I just felt the need to speak out and not only speak out, just to have some solution. And I, my solution is, is voting. It's voting. It is voting locally and it's voting nationally because I do feel like the, the young people in our world have a huge voice and they have a say to sway votes and, and sway the people that we have in office. Now we just have to align ourselves with people who can actually accomplish what we want. If police brutality is, is high on your priority, then you gotta get somebody there that has voted, number one, uh, historically voted uh, to have these laws change in, in favor of protecting uh, black people like they protect all people. Fantastic. You know, I, I, I want to wrap up just this first session, getting back to, to some of the things that have happened at 12 Inches Over. Jeff, has there been a, a session that went differently than you expected or, or one that stands out for you? Um, I, think, I think they all stand out because it's a two hour segment and I don't, I never think they're going to get to two hours and now we have gone over two hours, the last three or four segments. Um, I'm, I'm just amazed at the openness of the coaches, as well as the guests. Last night, we had a gentleman on from enforcement with the NCAA. And when I tell you he got grilled, he got grilled. And you know what? He stood toe to toe and answered every question as honestly as possible. And we respect that. And we respect that. We, you know, our, our language is a little um, vivid at times, but, um, you know, we, we, we respect it. We respect the fact when everyone comes on and speaks their mind and tells the truth. John Rothstein was on last night from, you know, CBS analyst. And he called Bruiser Flint before he came on. He said, how is it? Bruiser told him, you better be honest or they're going to come at you. And that's what, and, and, and that's, that's our, that's our mantra. That's, isn't it Lou and Dawn? That's what we believe in. We believe in 100% real. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. So we're going to bring you guys back out for the third session. Thank you for, for being with us today. We look forward to hearing more from you. Kendall, why don't you tell us about this first poll? Absolutely. So um, yeah, we're going to launch a poll here and obviously talking with, three great basketball coaches. So we wanted this first poll to be um, talking about leadership, uh, talking about those opportunities that are afforded to uh, non-white basketball coaches, right? So our first question is actually more of a trivia question uh, than an opinion poll. So we're asking you all, of all Division I basketball teams, what percentage of head coaches for men's teams are black coaches? and what percentage of head coaches in women's teams are black women. So we're gonna go ahead and launch this poll for a second and give you guys some time to 
choose uh, an answer here. And this is some of the uh, research that we do here at the Institute that uh, Dr. Scott Brooks heads up um, looking at, you know, what are the trends? What does the research show us? What are, what are those pipelines of opportunity? What does the data really show um, about being able to succeed and, and, and thrive and get to the top? And our first question from the audience actually touches on that too. So I'm gonna go ahead and thank this wonderful audience member, uh, actually from Stellenbosch University in South Africa. So I'm gonna submit this question here, but it's really interesting. Um, I don't know if you can see that question uh, there, Scott, but she's asking about, you know, WNBA, you know, why don't we see very many A coaches of color and African-American women coaches at the, at the head coach level? So great question. Yeah, All right, is. Absolutely so I'm, is. I'm gonna go ahead and end this poll here. Let's see what these results show. All right, so we had 29% of you thought that the percentage of uh, men's team head coach positions are held by black coaches, 16%. Uh, black women uh, heading up uh, women's teams, 22%. Um, the most of you thought that it was 24% men's black coaches heading up men's teams and 12% heading up uh, women's teams. The actual answer is men's 28% and women's 17%. So some progress, but we've got a long way to go there. Scott, what do you think? Yeah, you know, it, it, it is one of these, these storylines. When you look at it, we sometimes can get confused based on looking at the professional level Yep. The college level looks different than the professional level. There are a lot of teams out there. We're not always thinking about all the teams, right? Low major, mid major, uh, and the, the power five and whatnot. So it's easy to get a little bit you know, lost in these, these stats. But yeah. I'm glad that people responded. And you know, as you said, we, we don't always know if we can call it progress. We know that there's movement. Movement happens in different ways. It goes up and down as we see even in, in football and the Rooney rule. But, you know, we know that we want to see more. Yeah, and you and I were just talking about the fact that, you know, it matters because your student athletes, you know, what, is, what do they look like? You want somebody that reflects the community, right? So when you have overwhelmingly a uh, population of African-American student athletes and you have very few that are in positions of power, that matters, it matters, so. Um, and, thanks, and, that, and that really does help to, to lead us into the next session, Kendall. It's a, it's a great point because now we're bringing on Vanessa Jacobs. We're bringing on Carrick Jackson. And they are head coaches at historically black college, Southern University down in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And interestingly, they are head coaches of predominantly white sports. So Vanessa is the head coach of, of volleyball. She'll talk to us a little bit about what it looks like at Southern. And Carrick Jackson is the head coach of, of baseball. And so we'll get to see how it works from, from their side. Thank you for being on today, Vanessa and Carrick. Appreciate you having us on here. Thank you. So I, I want to start you know, talking about both of you were student athletes at predominantly white universities and institutions. So. I, I want to start with thinking, how does your experience as student athletes vary from your actual players' experiences at Southern? Vanessa, why don't you start for us? Well, um, I'll tell you, being an African-American at a predominantly white institution, one of the biggest things is I was the minority. And it was comfortable for me because that's what I was accustomed to being on the West Coast and the area that I'm from. Um, I will say going from a predominantly white institution to coaching at an HBCU, you are now the majority. And that, with that being said, there is a sense of pride. And I didn't know that sense of pride being that I went to um, LSU. So that was one of the biggest things. And there's not just pride in just being black, it's pride in your school, it's pride in being an athlete because everyone gravitates to you. There's pride in 
um, being, you know, in an organization, whether it be Greek or a club or whatever it was, there is definitely a huge sense of pride. So that's what I love about being here at Southern University. Great. And Coach Kerry, tell us what, what it's been like for you and how do you compare the experiences? So, um, as you know, I, I actually had dual experiences, right? Uh, I went to junior college and then I went from junior college to Bethune-Cookman University, which is an HBCU uh, and, and was there for a year, uh, ironically, on a all black team. Uh, for the most part, we had a couple kids from Puerto Rico with a white coaching staff. Um, and then uh, we win a conference championship there. Our head coach gets an opportunity to go to a PWI. He leaves. I then decide to leave and also go and transfer to the University of Nebraska. Uh, so, so it was for me as an athlete, it was kind of both spectrums, if you will, of being able to experience both those realms. Uh, and so then coming back to an HBCU as a coach, um, after spending a year here as a player, it also kind of put me in a situation where I was familiar with how things were going to be. Um, and then taking my experiences of coaching other places, uh, you know, coaching at the Big 12 and the SEC and being able to bring that here. Um, so the reason why I came was to give that opportunity to, to our black kids that are playing this game to kind of take them to another level. So, and, 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 you know, these sound like wonderful experiences when you talk about being able to be the majority, which most of us don't get to experience if we're, if we're people of color, if we're, if we're black. And for you all to be able to bring both sides of it, you're coming from places that have resources in LSU, in Nebraska. Coach Carrick, you've also been at the University of Missouri. So you've been at these bigger conference places. You've seen what it's like there. And you've had experiences under white coaches. You know, when you think of your experiences as coaches, how does that vary? And maybe it's thinking of when you're competing against teams, that are what you experience as a student athlete, the LSUs of the Nebraska. It may be thinking of the coaching organizations, but what is it like to be the minority from your coaching clubs? Well, for me, being I was a dual sport athlete um, in junior college and at LSU. Um, but going back to your question, I was accustomed to being either one of two black kids on the team. And with that, you had a sense of you had to be number one. You ha you couldn't sit on the bench. There's no way. Like, why are you even on a team? So it's making sure you had everything in, you know, your ducks in a row academically, um, you know, athletically, and just doing you as a player. And then going from, you know, as a player to coaching these kids now, they're no longer the one of two black kids on their team. Everyone's black. So they have to figure out where they stand um, on the pecking order. And for most of them, it's very difficult. It's an adjustment for sure. Okay. Coach Carey. So, you know, I, I think one of the things, obviously, in the sport of baseball, like you talked about at the beginning, being a predominantly white sport, is getting our kids to have an understanding and a belief system um, that – our game is one where you're not playing against the other team, right? Um, and as much as our kids want to have that facade of we're just as good, they still walk in with some sense of an inferiority complex. And so what my job for our guys is to teach them, hey, we're going to teach you how to play this game the right way. And your athleticism and your ability to compete will allow you to go out in those environments and be competitive. Our sport is so much different. Um, if When Southern University – goes and they play a school in the SEC, if they win, boy, that's, that's a big deal. Um, that, that game is not – you're not expected to be able to win that game. But in baseball, we can go play an SEC school and be competitive. And now once we get our kids to shift their mindset to understand that, hey, as black players being coached by a black coach, we can play this game at a very, very high level if you guys understand the nuances that need to take place if you are disciplined and accountable – with yourselves and your teammates to go out there and put us in a position to be successful, then that's exactly what will happen. So, and you know, this, this really talks to identity, talks to how the role that you all are playing in identity, having to help them to think about themselves in this world, which, you know, coaches overall do that, but you've got a very particular job when you are shepherding 
right? These black athletes. So coach Vanessa, I can, I've looked at your roster and, and I'm only thinking of what I saw, you know, yesterday and looking at your roster. But one may think that at a historically black college, you're only going to have black athletes. And that's not what I saw. So how does it, does it change your mindset in recruiting? How do you go into the homes of non-black athletes and talk about the what it's going to be like for them to come to a black campus? Well, for me as a recruiter, I don't sell Southern University first. I sell myself. I think if they can fall in love with me as a coach and they know that I'm going to take care of their daughter, um, that's going to be half the battle. From there, we bring them on to Southern. We talk to them about the tr rich tradition and it, they are normally sold. I had a kid a few years ago. She was from Utah. And it's funny because I had my white friend saying, how did you get a kid from Utah? Like you didn't just get a white girl, you got a lily white girl. And I thought it was funny. I was like, look at me. Of course she's gonna love it once she meets me, once she gets to Southern University. But I had to sell her on us, so I had to sell her on the university. And she wanted to be in Baton Rouge and experience it. And it was a great experience for her. Um, so that's just what I do. I, I sell them on me first. Thank you. Coach Carrick, how about you? Are there different things you say to parents that if they're a black athlete and then if they're a black athlete, uh, white athlete or a Latino athlete or an Asian athlete, are, is the approach the same? So the, the initial approach is the same, but we also have to deal with the realities, right? And the realities of, of it when you're recruiting white athletes and particular baseball players come in our environment, they're going to be the minority. And there's a lot of parents that ask me and have questions about that. And so what I tell them is make sure that you understand this is an opportunity for your son to have a different perspective on life. That they get to see what it is like from the other side in essence, because now for the first time in their lives, they will be in the minority, which they've never been in before. That's the first thing. Second, you are going to be a minority by choice. You don't have to come here. You don't have to be part of our program. This is not the institution that you have to attend. So the idea that you're going to be a minority by choice, then now we take away your apprehension of worrying about how you're going to be treated. Because as black folks, we have always been the minority and not by choice. We have always been the oppressed and not by choice. So that when people make the decision to come and be on our campus that, of, that are of different races, then we know that they've made that decision by choice so there's going to be some instant acceptance when it comes to that. When we're talking to our black kids, what I tell them is my job is to make sure that I put them in a position that they grow up and understand what it's, to, what it's going to be to be a black male in our society. You and I have had this conversation. It's the one thing I say consistently. To me, the most amazing dichotomy in our society is that of the educated black male. That's just my opinion. And the reason why I say that is because on one half of the room, they're the most feared person in that room because they're a black male with an education. On the other half of that room, they're the most awe-inspiring person in that room because they're a black male with an education. My job and our job as a coaching staff is to make sure that we teach them how to navigate both sides of that room. Take the people on the one side that have that hatred and negativity towards them, disarm them of that, don't feed into that, and get them to be on that other side of the room. Because now, as a black male with an education, you have everybody pulling in the same direction that you are on that same rope. There's nothing that is more powerful than that. That's fantastic. Very powerful things that you all are saying. I'm really excited for us to get back. I want you to just hold tight as we bring everybody else back on. As we do that, I want to ask a question to our audience. How many HBCUs can you name, right? This is, this is a trick. This is a question that many may not be able to answer very well, but I want you to use the Q&A box to answer, and then we're going to move into our final segment. So again, how many HBCUs can you name? Go ahead and put that in the Q&A as we get ready for our final segment. And I'd like to invite back Coach Jeff Arnold, Coach Don Staley, Coach Lou Ritchie as we come in to our third segment. Ken, I don't know if you have any housekeeping for us. Nope, everybody can continue to um, utilize the Q&A box. Uh, and uh, we've got some great questions. So uh, Scott, we'll be sending those to you if you wanna um, ask those from the audience there too. I'll be sending that directly. Okay, 
Thanks. So now that we've got everyone back on, I, I want to talk about what's going on with your athletes and how they're managing in this time. They, they've been hit not only with this COVID. For some of you, if we're talking about a coach Jackson who was in the midst of baseball season, the basketball coaches, you all were about to head into the, the tournaments or you were in your tournaments. I think, you know, I remember talking to Jeff and he said right before a game, everything went down and, and you know, as one domino fell from a power five, then they saw it coming. Some people were literally on the court. Coach Don, I know you were sitting at ranking number one and you said, hey, just give us the trophy. Let, you know, we earned it. We're on a 26 game win streak, right? But Coach Carrick, you're, you're getting ready to take the field on a doubleheader, and this goes down. So I, I got to imagine your players are going through things. We know that spring players were granted another year of eligibility, but basketball players, right, they've lost something there. And so I, I, I really want to pay give some acknowledgement to that struggle that they have had to go through and how you all have had to help them manage and add to that what has gone on with the, the passing of George Floyd, with that murder, with him dying at the hands of the police, with Breonna Taylor, with her death. You know, I want us to be able to talk about this. So, Coach Don, in your piece, the piece that you wrote for the Players' Tribune, you talk about those who are in, priv who are in privileged positions don't have to think about what Blacks have to think about daily, right? You ask this question, am I doing right by our players? So if you all can take a little bit of time and tell us what are some of these conversations, some of the conversations you are having with your athletes. And so I'll start from the bottom. Lou, Coach Lou, why don't you tell us some of the conversations that you're having with your athletes at this time? Sure. Um, <clears throat> you know, for us, it's, it's kind of been a powder keg out here. We had won 18 in a row. We were two games away from winning our state championship. And the morning of is when California canceled everything for both our men's and women's team. So we had to bring them together and show care and love for them. And then shortly thereafter, a young man on my team, his older sister committed suicide. And she was in college um, and she was home during the, the, the COVID. So now we have a tremendous more amount of loss. And you go to a memorial, and this is in the height of, of COVID, how do you mourn during COVID? Do you hug? Do you touch? How close do you get? Um, so we had a memorial outside their house, and you know, 200, 250 people just in the street. Um, so I, I think it's, you have that, and then you have the latest case you know, of, of race that you know, comes to the top. And, uh, we had a Zoom meeting last Saturday, which was after the first riots. It was our end of the year celebration. And I was nervous about even having that. But the young man whose sister left us, I asked him, did he want us to go forward with the celebration? And it was very healing and therapeutic for everyone to get together, see each other on Zoom and talk about things and, and then go protest, um, which is what they wanted to do individually. It wasn't something that I tried to spark or lead because I want everyone to stay socially distant, but you have to have conversations. You have to uh, let people know you love and you care. And I try to tell our kids all the time, have an intentional strategy. It have an intentional strategy of what you're going to do. Wow. That's, I, I can't imagine what that must feel like for you, your player, for the parents. It's great that as sport, as we know, when you're on a team, you can come and support one another. Um, but yeah, you know, our thoughts, our, our, our thoughts and prayers go out to your basketball community. Thanks for sharing that. Coach Vanessa, what, what are some of the conversations you're having with your team? Well, our kids are a little angry um, just about what's going on um, with George Floyd. Um, and what my job is to listen to them. So that's what I've been doing when we have our team Zoom calls. I sit back and I just let them talk. I let them express themselves because, you know, I, I've always taught them, you know, what you put on social media, you can't get back. So please understand that you are representing our university, you're representing our program, and then you're representing your family. You're kind of like last in the equation. I don't want them to feel last, but I want them to be able to express themselves 
while they're angry in a safe circle, you know? Um, and as far as, uh, that's, you know, I tell them, you know, you have a purpose in life and your passion is gonna lead you to that purpose. We just wanna do it the right way. We wanna be peaceful about it. Um, and if you want to go and protest in your respective cities, then go protest. Just make sure you're being safe. You, I, it's really hard to use social distancing, but you know, do what you feel is correct and do what you feel is right. And I'll support you every step of the way. Coach Carrick, how about you? So, yeah, like you said, uh, we, it's, it's funny because we were playing a game that Wednesday night. Uh, the game is over. Uh, and tradition in just like every other sport when the game's over, coaches go, we meet at the home plate and shake hands. And uh, the coach from UNO uh, says to me, hey, NBA just canceled their season. I was like, what? And so then obviously we get on the bus, turn on the TV, we start hearing everything. You know, then I get a text from University of Arkansas Pine Bluff, who was supposed to come play us that weekend. Hey, they're not letting us come. And then kind of everything falls from there. And, and so dealing with that, uh, when it happened, uh, again, I'm one of those people that, hey, it is what it is. So let's deal with it for what it is, put a plan together, and then move forward. And so what I told our guys was that instead of looking this as a negative, look at it as a positive because this is an opportunity for you to have some personal growth and development during this time. You went through some things through, through a, a short portion of the season, and so now we can kind of reflect and look back on those and then be prepared. And so kind of we – had a plan in place. We started doing Zoom calls, started talking about personal development, really didn't talk about the sport. Um, told my coaching staff the same thing. Hey, listen, focus on getting better. If we don't, if we aren't better when this comes out, we all need to go get new jobs um, because you're not dedicated to what it is that you're doing. So, and then we get into where we're at right now with, like you said, these killings and the protesting. And so then that's another issue. And, and then again, reaching out to them and talking to them about, it, it ironically and luckily for me, it kind of folded into the things that we were talking about before with the personal development piece was, okay, here we are full circle. And as black men, and we have five white kids on our team. Um, and as, as, as white men, how do you feel about the things that are taking place and what's going on? And obviously we had you on our zoom yesterday to kind of share some of those things. Um, so I think our kids are, um, they have a feeling about it, uh, but, uh, it hasn't really sunk in yet. So we're going to continue to have those conversations and challenge them to share feelings and thoughts uh, as we move forward. Thanks. Coach Don, what it, what's been going on with you and your team and how are you talking about these things? Um, I mean, that's what we're doing. We're, we're talking about them. We're, we're Zooming. Uh, we're, we're giving our players, I text them on the side in between our Zoom calls just to give them a place um, to have their raw thoughts in, in one place. Um, I mean, we're, we're in a day and age with, with social media. You know, they, their knee-jerk reaction is to post something on social media. And for, for us, I'm okay with them using their voice. But sometimes young people don't understand. Like, we're, we're in the South. We got a predominantly Black team. And we're in South Carolina, which has a, a rich history of racism and, 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 and what have you. Um, but I will say, if you look at our games and the amount of people that come to our games, we'll probably look a lot different than any other sport on our campus in that it is full of everybody, every race, every creed. Uh, friendships is, are, are made. So we're doing something a little bit different here, but but still, we, we still represent the state of South Carolina um, as USC um, employees and, and players. So I, I told them that Use your voice, but understand, people may not agree and align with your voice, so you have to be ready for the response that may not be favorable. And if it's not favorable, you have to arm yourself with enough knowledge about what you're voicing so, so you can clap back a little bit. And, you know, I, it happens to me all the time where, you know, if I, like the Players' Tribune, some people take, some, some people here in South Carolina took one sentence out of the Players' Tribune. That sentence was, I understand why people are writing. I did not say I agree. I said I understand. I understand why they're writing because they have been voicing things 
and on to the tune of a, a deaf ear. And if you're not being heard, you're gonna take a, a different approach. Am I a writer? I went out to protest. I, I went here and protested. It was a peaceful one where I, I learned a whole lot from all the speakers that got up and spoke um, to, to have some resolution with what's going on. Um, but then you have the, the other people, you know, someone on the radio show here dedicated a whole segment of, I disagree with Dawn's sentence of, she's understanding why people are, are right. And I wasn't on the show. I wasn't really invited on the show to defend that. But what if, now, now here's what the thing, what if you have an audience, you got a narrative, you got, a, you got people who listen to you. What if the same people that listen to you link up with what you think is something that's so furthest from the truth. And if you read the whole article, you will comprehend that that is not what I said. Nowhere near close to it. So again, I understand where I am. Understand that people aren't gonna, gonna uh, like everything that I say, but here it is. I'm, I'm open to have those uncomfortable conversations. If they're gonna lead to systemic change, if it's gonna lead to long-term solutions, I'm okay, I, I will be that, you know, that poster child for name calling and all of that, as long as we're progressing. And I, and I will say, I've, I've heard from so many of my, my white friends over the past week, they wanna do more. Because now they, they, they have somewhat, somewhat of a semblance of what we go through every single day. When the, when the table is turned on, how you handle certain situations um, with a black person, um, they, they're thinking now, and I, I had a friend who called me today, and, and, and this might be good for everybody. She has a, she has a child with uh, Down syndrome, and she almost equates, you know, how her child is discriminated against because of, uh, because of his condition. And that's very similar to what we have to deal with all of our lives, all of our lives. I'm in South Carolina. I know I'm the one of two black head coaches here. Um, so I, I know I'm the a minority here. Um, I, I do know I have a voice as well. So I wanna use my voice for, for change. I wanna use my platform as coach for change. We have some of that with the people who come watch us play. I just wanna continue that out into the broader world. And, and you know, that, that Players' Tribune article, again, I hats off to it to you i thought it was um you were so generous with telling us about your story you know your connection to south carolina before we even talk about you being a coach there you know the fact that your mother is from south carolina and that's not an easy you know history in a past right that she left south carolina her mother asked her to in fear of something happening to her and here you are in south carolina making a difference in you know, I just applaud you for that and, and your honesty and being so open in a, in a public forum like that. So thank you. Coach Jeff, what, what are some of these conversations you're having with your team? We, we've heard about how you're, you're bringing coaches together. How is this translating into the conversations you're having with your players? Well, we had a multitude of different things that happened. Actually, when it all went down with COVID, we had six graduating seniors. You know, so we had a team that was actually leaving, you know, the university and it was, it was um, unfinished to say the least for them. And uh, so we got past that issue. They finished, everybody finished the school and everything, but we have nine new players coming to us. So we started to have Zoom sessions as far back as, as soon as the pandemic hit, just to learn our team. And, and we have a great group of new young players uh, with, with all the kids we have coming in. And I'll, I keep saying, I don't know how good we're going to be on the court, but we're a pretty good team just by the feeling that these kids give us. So that's been going fantastic. And we felt very comfortable and, and, and good, you know, getting past COVID and trying to, trying to keep them stimulated and, and keep developing part of our team. Like Dawn said, winning this time. And then all of a sudden this hits, you know, and, and I'm a big believer 
of like knowing your history. So we, we had our players, we, 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 we talked to our players, um, you know, about George Floyd. And then we talked to our players about, you know, Ahmed Aubrey. And, and so we talked to our players about, but then I also told them about every other situation that I've come in. I'm 55 years old. So I've seen this. I've seen this time and time and time again. So I gave them a perspective from where I was from and, and why I was feeling, you know, some kind of way. And a few, few of our kids, you know, had some issues. And, and, and one of them we went to a, a predominantly white school and, and you know, uh, they talked about Black Lives Matter. And, and one of his classmates, you know, all lives matter. So it was gotten to a discussion. I said, oh, you know, one of our guys said, doesn't all lives matter? And I said, we're not saying that. We're saying at this time, Black Lives Matter. When, when somebody has on a shirt that says that's supporting breast cancer, does somebody come up and say, I support all cancer? No, it's, you know what I'm saying? It, I, saw the, I saw the cartoon on that. So it, it, you're trying to reverse the, the, the field. And I think that the narrative is always changing. And, and I told our players that and try to get them to learn about their history learn so so when you're in a situation you can defend your position so like one of the things that dawn said knowledge is key i i implore them to 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 learn to keep learning every day about every situation talk to your old head talk to someone else and so you get a chance to learn so now you can defend your position and we talked about tweeting and we talked about social media and we actually asked them guys before you do anything run it through us because they don't understand the the, the kickback on what can happen and how their whole situation can be changed it's it, you know it's, it's athletes that are getting their scholarships rescinded because they they on something really different and that, that's the biggest thing. Like uh, Coach Jacob said, you represent the university, you represent your team, and you represent your family. You know, like you, I would say family, university, team, then yourself. So you, it's your, I even push them down a little further, Coach. <laughs> you know, but, but that's where it stands. And that, that's what we're all about. And we have, we have four African-American Coaches and I actually, excuse me, we have four black coaches. I don't say African American. I'm black because I'm from the Black Power movement. <laughs> I'm a little older than you guys. <laughs> Thank you all so much. I mean, we really are getting a taste for you all's leadership, right? Coaching is all about this leadership. It's all about leading young people, and we're we're glad that you all are at the helms doing that. I've got a question from someone uh, who's a part of our audience. And it's geared really at Coach Jacobs and Jack Jackson, excuse me, I believe. Do white athletes leave HBCUs as advocates and allies for the African-American community is the question. Coach Jackson, I'll let you start. <laughs> um, you know what, I, I think that it varies, right? I think that um, some of the white athletes that we have, they come and they see it. Uh, as the experience for what it is. They get their degree, they move on, and it is what it is. And they may go back and talk about, you know, I had some of my best experiences in college. Um, I don't necessarily know if they get out there waving that flag. Um, and and it, it probably has something to do with the kids, the way that they are today. Uh, then you have your um, white athletes that come here that even though they're here, they still believe that they're above us. Um, from, you know, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I could have gone division two, but I really wanted to go division one. And this is my only division one option. So let me go and be here. And, and even in being here and, and understanding that they are part of what it is that we're doing, there's still that belief system in them is, uh, this wasn't my first choice, but this was the only choice that I had. So let me go here and still believe that they're above where we're at. So I think it takes uh, some of the kids to be in the situation and the environment to go through some things to then have a better understanding of what their place will be as they move on and continue to wave that flag. Okay. I believe uh, the kids that we've had, they leave here with a different 
perspective on life and how we teach them and you know you're going to have these struggles you're going to, all throughout life there are going to be stop signs uh, yield signs and you're going to have to figure out ways to maneuver around them um, but what's really good for me is when I have a student athlete who is white or Hispanic um, or mixed they come back or they call me, text me, email me and say, coach, I had a really great experience at Southern University. Um, and because of you, I was able, or because of Southern University, not me, I was able to get past my um, prejudices or whatever the case is. And when someone, an African-American or a black person sees them repping their t-shirt, they're like, you went to Southern University? Like, how do you know about Southern University? So, you know, they get to come back and tell me about that. And it's just, it's a sense of pride and it's not just black people, you know, for, for my team, in my experience. Yeah, that's great. You know, Coach Don, we, we, we asked the question, multiple choice of, looking at the percentage of black uh, basketball players in, in, at the college level, on the men's side and the women's side. And then we asked, well, what percentage of, on the men's side are, have head coaches who are black and what percentage on the women's side? And you know, people didn't get it quite right. They thought that there were more men's uh, on the men's side, somewhere around 50%. They thought that there, there was a high percentage uh, or a higher, about a third third of those coaches would be head coaches and would be black. And on the women's side, you know, they, they struggled. And I think it's tough. It's only about, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere around 18, 19% um, are black women. And so the question that we got from the audience is, what's your view of the lack of African-American women coaches in the WNBA? And that comes from, you know, a couple of people. One from one of our audience members from South Africa, um, and I think also from Coach Julie Rousseau. I'm not sure if you know Coach Julie. Yeah, but you know, what's your view on the WNBA and the pipeline or the lack of black women as head coaches? Um, well, we discussed this on 12 inches over. Uh, and it, it, it applies uh, whether it's out in um, corporate America, whether it's on college campuses, um, or now the, the, the WNBA is a discussion. GMs and people in those decision-making positions, they aren't black. And they, they're not hiring people that, that they don't know. And a lot of times, I, I'm one, I like to hire people that I know. And more times than not, my circle is, is full of black people. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna you know, cater to those people who I know that are highly qualified for the job. And it goes to the same token as GMs, you know, it's no different. It's probably a little bit better in the NBA, um, a little bit better. But the WNBA, I know those teams are, are there, you know, the, the decision makers are, are white. Um, and I, you know, the, the WNBA, honestly, from a coaching standpoint, is, is not very stable. Mm -hmm. And people are looking for some stability. You know, a, a lot of people ask me if I want to coach on I sure don't. I sure don't. I'm, I'm good. It's not because it's not the stability. Like I, I don't even want to coach in the NBA. People have asked me that. I, that's not really where my passion is. My passion is being a dream merchant for young people uh, to safeguard um, our the next level, the pros. We want the WNBA to be around for a very long time. And, and so hopefully we have, I hope, hopefully I'm coaching somebody that's going to own a team one day. And then they'll be in the position of hiring whoever they, they want to hire. Um, but, but giving, you know, us an opportunity to be in those positions of, of coaching the WNBA team. So um, I, I, the, the answer is not surprising. It's what's happening um, at, at every level that, you know, people who are making decisions about um, corporate America, about, you know, hiring ADs and coaches and so forth. Thanks. And, I, and we're going to wrap it up with, with a final question. I'm going to ask each of you to give us three things that sports leadership can do. You know, we want to know what more can they do to end this anti-Black racism in sport, particularly as I think we think about hiring, 
but not simply about hiring. Maybe it's also about the student athletes. You know, what more can we, can we ask of sport leadership? Why don't we start with you, Vanessa? I think having focus groups and listening to the student athletes. Um, I believe that if you have a platform for them to come in, well, again, like I said, to uh, as having a safe space to voice your opinion and to educate everyone around you and not wait for them. Hey, let me tell you about my background um, and expect the unexpected. Just go out there and um, educate er not just yourself, but everyone else. Thank you. Coach Kerry. Um, I, I, I think uh, I think you first start with the idea of being able to admit whatever our role may or may not be in the current situation. And that's white folks and black folks, right? Like, I don't think black folks should be absolved of the idea that how have we contributed to potentially some of the things that are going on because of lack of action or lack of education or communication or whatever it is. Uh, and then from there, then I think it is communicate and educate. Um, I think it's don't be afraid to voice your opinions. Um, as you talked about, I've had many of my friends that are white coaches call me up and, hey, I got 38 players, four of them are black. What do I say? Um, and, and the first thing that I tell them is don't say that because you recruit black players that that absolves you from being racist or prejudiced because that, that's not the case. Um, don't tell them that um, you don't allow that to take place in your locker room. That That is not solving the issue or get that that's just that specific and you're trying to justify the reasons why you don't want people to consider you to be a racist um whereas at the end of the day you and i talk about this i believe we all have some subconscious racist in us all of us um about black folks about white folks about whatever the case is so first being able to admit that and then communicate and educate after that thanks coach lou you said three words Three things, three things sports leadership can do. 12 inches over. <laughs> that, that's no, um, I thought about this is what I mentioned earlier. I mean, I think we have to be thoughtful. Uh, I think people need to be loving and caring and there needs to be an intentional strategy. Uh, people need to be very intentional at this point in time and, and really come together. Uh, you know, like Don said earlier, voting is gonna be the major key, getting everyone to fill out the census. Um, so, yeah, I, just, I want to thank Jeff and Scott for giving me this PhD in 12 inches over. So thank you. <laughs> Coach Jeff, what are your thoughts on sports leadership? Give us three things you think that could be done. Ownership. And I mean ownership of you. Not ownership of a team, or ownership of you and your ideas on both sides. I think Coach Carrick said it. We both got to, we got to look at what we do. Ownership of you. Another one is relationships. You got to put yourself out there to learn and to know people. And then inclusion. Sports leadership has to start including the world is global. So it, it's, it's not vanilla anymore. It's global. It's all kind of flavors. So for us to succeed, I think it's best that we have, you know, like Baskin Robbins, 31 flavors or whatever it is. I'm, I'm about every, you got to, everybody got to be involved, you know. Appreciate you. All right, Coach Don, you're you're bringing us home. What are the three um, things? I mean, I mean, the panel had they brought up some great things that 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 are all useful in how we move forward in sports leadership. I, I think that the key to it all is we have to be organic. You 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 have to be real. You know, Jeff said relationships. Relationships can be superficial. You gotta have real relationships. You gotta be able to have hard conversations. Um, and I, I do think, you know, like our university is gonna start this for all incoming freshmen, they're gonna have to take this diversity um, course. Why them? When you got a school full of some racist people and students and coaches and administrators, it, everybody's gotta be in that room, um, broaden their horizon. And we need, to, we need to know who we're working with. We need to know who we're working for. And it has to be organic. And if, if, if you're not going to hire other black people in this university, at least hear the ones that you have out. Because we, we, we hear your voice every single day. 
because you that's how you govern that's how you lead and it's it's not to say i think it's is a racist environment or prejudice environment it's just you don't know if you're you if you don't have you know diversity in in you know the higher ups in the president's office in the ad's office in the athletic if you don't have people who are diverse in that group then you're you're leaving you're you're leaving a a, a small or large part of it off um, I'm, I'm happy where I am, meaning I love representing this university. I love the fact that people allow me to be me, just me, whatever it is, good, bad, or indifferent, I can be me. I can say what I want to say. If I offend somebody, I hope they say I, you offended me so I can apologize or I can, I can give them an explanation as how I felt in that moment. I just don't think there's enough of that in this world. And I don't think it's an, I, I think we got it. I think we got that from the top, meaning, you know, meaning our president says and does whatever he wants to do. Um, is it divisive? I, I do believe so. I do believe so. But until we're able to unify and have some organic conversations and relationships, I think we're going to continue to see what we're seeing. Thank you all for, for really giving us an enlightening, enlightening panel. Thank you for your, your openness and your honesty. Uh, we hope that you all move forward and have all the best seasons. We want all of you to win, right? Good thing is you all aren't competing against one another, so I can say that without picking favorites. I want to wish you all the best. Thanks again, and please come back. We're going to have more events, and we'd love to see you again. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, Kendall, we've got one last poll. That's right. And it goes along with exactly uh, the question that was posed to each of our panelists. So one more poll. What ways do you think that leaders of sport organizations could do better to retain and assist black coaches? So this is multiple choice. So everybody can uh, put in their answers there. Uh, including our panelists here. And I want to thank everybody for uh, really engaging with us on the Q&A. That was spectacular. We had some really great questions. Um, really appreciate it. If you have follow-up questions with us, we are recording this session. We're going to send it out to everybody. We've been live streaming this on Twitter the entire time. Uh, this, this has been an incredible conversation. Thanks to each one of our panelists and to you, Scott Brooks, for, for leading us. So, all right. I'm going to... End this in two seconds. Here we go. We're ready for the results. Here we are. All right. So what ways do you think that leaders of sport organizations could do better to retain and assist black coaches? This was multiple choice. Uh, harsher financial penalties for lack of diversity in staff at 21% choose that. Hire more athletic directors of color, 65% sports leadership actively and publicly condemns racism 47 percent prioritize diversity in university ncaa administration and boards 63 percent sports leadership submits to outside audit of policies and practices 40 percent some people have more uh to say so if you want to submit into the uh, q a what wasn't represented on here that you would like to see sports leadership uh taking ownership of to uh coach jeff's point uh and and let us know in that in that uh q a box so my local little poll right here in the house the household they voted for the athletic directors of color so they're right in line with that all right, we appreciate y'all. Have a safe and healthy weekend. Thank you for being with us. We're going to sign off now.